Our Alaska adventure is over. Or is it? We are now in the great land of Canada and today we are visiting Dawson City. Then we begin the long journey south on the Klondike Highway. We will spend the night at one of the best boondocking sites ever. We'll revisit our sign at the Signpost Forest in Watson Lake. Then we'll take the Stuart Cassier scenic route to an exclave called Hyder, Alaska. Yeah, there is one more thing in the 49th state. Then south to Vancouver, and then across the continent, all the way to Florida. I'm riding, 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 riding in my RV, my RV wherever I want to be. Because I'm free in my RV. Today we're driving east, marking the beginning of our return trip. And this may have been our longest trip to date, for sure the farthest we've ever driven. We're still over 5,000 miles away from home. The top of the world is a lonely road, but we're almost at Dawson City. This is the Yukon River and I had no idea we were supposed to get on a ferry. It is, by the way, a free ferry running constantly 24-7 in the summer months, except for Friday morning where they pause for maintenance. comes our ride. Look at it, how they come crossing at an angle, fighting the strong current. They waste no time now, do they? Such expertise, how they can unload with the ferry still kind of in motion. And uh, here we are, Dawson City. It has a little bit of a wild, wild west look to it. A frontier town, for sure. We're going to be staying at Gold Rush Campground, impeccably located. Well, yeah, the RV park is uh, almost like a parking lot. But anyway, here we are, Dawson City in the Yukon Territory. Beautiful day, a little smoky, that's all. Uh, let's go explore the town a little bit. Let's get the lay of the land. Here's the gambling hall. They're supposed to have a nightly burlesque show. And here's the Masonic Temple. Amazing how well preserved everything is, considering the harsh winters here. In order to see the interior of some of these buildings, you have to join a tour that departs from the visitor center. These two are called the Kissing Buildings, since they are kind of leaning into each other. Here's another historic building. 
We came back to the campground because it is so centrally located that we're going to be doing that a lot actually. But now the bells are tolling, so let's go check out the church. That's cool. This is St. Mary's Catholic Church. The current building dates back to 1902. Let's see what it looks like inside. Bon été. Please take off your shoes before you go to the church. They are getting ready for Mass. St. Mary's Catholic Church. So yeah, simple old church. I even spoke to the priest. Apparently they, they're having a 5 p.m. Mass today. That's why the bell was tolling. This is Madame Tremblay's store here. Everything is very historic here in town. And across the street, we have the post office, built in the year 1900. It's all very picturesque, and as I said, so well preserved. Here's the interpretive sign about the post office. December 1900. Miss still standing. It's the Palace, Palace Grand Theater. From 1899. Let's stop by the visitor center, maybe get a tourist map with all the points of interest. This is the Danoja Zhou Cultural Center, with exhibits about the history and culture of the first people of the Klondike. And I believe this is the back, actually. Here we have once again the mighty Yukon River. Oh, bummer, it seems to be closed. Here's the SS Kino, which dates back to around 1922, so it is over 100 years old. These riverboats were the lifeline to the outside world, until they were retired in the 1950s, when the roads were built. It is so well preserved, that at certain times of the day you can join tours of the inside. Let's see if we can. There goes the ferry. It would be really cool to be able to take a cruise along the Yukon River. Hmm, community radio station. Let's see what it looks like inside. There's a mixer, double CD and double cassette decks, hmm, pretty vintage stuff, and records. Oh, really cool to see a, an old school radio station. Now, I believe our next point of interest is right there, at the downtown hotel. Jack London Grill, Grace's gift shop, 
and the world-famous Sourdough Saloon. This place is famous for the Sour Toe Cocktail, which actually contains a pickled human toe. Mm -mm, no thanks, I'll just have an IPA. There seems to be a large tour group, so after waiting 15 minutes, we left. Well, we went in, but I guess the place is too famous for its own good. How long have we, we waited? Like 15 minutes and maybe more. And uh, yeah, they kind of acknowledged us, but then the beers never came, so we left. The Drunken Goat Taverna has really good reviews. Something smells good. Drunken Goat Taverna. Let's check it out. Too bad we're not hungry, but we're definitely coming back for dinner tomorrow. Fat Tug IPA. Here we are by the Kissing Buildings once again. Officially 3rd Avenue Complex. Apparently, when you build heated buildings over permafrost, they begin to sink. Who would have thought? And these two have been kept unrestored so we can see it. Here's Billy Big's blacksmith shop. Let's take a peek inside. Dawson City, very, very picturesque town. Ooh, a mummified mermaid. Only in Dawson City, I guess. That's how you have to build here, elevated. We wanted to stop by the casino, but on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, they only do the burlesque show and you have to make reservations, so we decided not to do it. Again, it never got dark last night. Well, as you can see, we broke our stove on the bumpy roads of Alaska, so let's fix that. Yeah, over the past few weeks I've noticed screws on the floor here and there, and I had no idea where they belonged. Well, now I do, at least some of them. I'm still missing a bracket and some of the rubber washers, but... It'll work. Let's make some breakfast. While the bacon cooks, I'm going to chop an onion. I also have a yellow pepper. Let's do salt all around, black pepper and cayenne pepper. I forgot I also had some ham.
hopefully it came out good. I already ate the bacon and this is certainly going to be the most important meal of the day. <laughs> well, maybe we'll have dinner tonight. Anyway, bon appetit. <sighs> we decided to take a walk and you know, walk off that breakfast, which was, was almost like lunch. I mean, that's, uh, that was big. But since we're not going to have lunch anyway, we might as well just wait for dinner. And uh, we've had two disappointments here in town. And the first one, of course, I don't want to sound too negative. It's a charming town. I love the architecture, you know, the old, you know, it's, it looks authentic, like an authentic, has that old west kind of look, which in this case is probably more accurate to call it like a, like a gold rush a kind of look, a kind of town. But, uh, well, the second disappointment was uh, the, the casino here, a gambling hall. I mean, I don't really gamble, but we just wanted to go in, you know, normally it's a casino, you know, there's a, you know, you go in, you have a drink at the casino and they have, you know, like the, the burlesque show is like, like the icing on the cake, right? But on Mondays, I mean, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, when we are here, um, they, they take a break from the gambling and uh, what they do is, you know, it's like a show, just, just the show. That's the only thing that is open and you have to buy tickets and we don't really feel like... You know, we wanted to have a more casual experience, so um, uh, we're not going to do that. <laughs> and the other thing was the sourdough saloon, which, you know, I, I wasn't going to have the sourdough, the, the sour thumb cocktail in a way, which is a thing there. Uh, I wasn't really going to have that, but, uh, you know, I just wanted to sit down. The place is historic, has the ambience, but when we were there, it was probably our luck. Uh, you know, there was like a tour there, and they, they, they seemed like they were super understaffed. So, you know, even the lady took our order, but she started doing something else. Like, she forgot about us. And uh, we waited and waited, and we were like, you know what? We're going to have an IPA. We can have an IPA anywhere. So, in fact, yesterday, the highlight was that Greek restaurant. And that's where we're thinking we're going. We're going to try to go and, and have dinner there today. But as you can see, it is a, it's a charming town. And uh, considering how far north, how remote we really are here, if you look at it on the map, yeah, I thought, I thought the town was going to be a lot more rough around the edges than it is. It is, it is lovely. Now, today we were thinking also of, of doing some tours. They have tours of the of the boat there, the, the river boat, and they have city tours. But we really, 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 really do need to make it a work day today. I'm really behind on the editing, so I'm just gonna work in the morning. And this afternoon, we're going back into town and probably go to the Greek place. And then tomorrow, tomorrow we start heading south. We're gonna kind of make a beeline for Whitehorse. But in three days, we wanna be in Stewart. Also worth it to note that, yeah, the Alaska portion of our trip is officially over. And uh, at some point, you know, I'm going to reflect on this month, I mean, five weeks that we spent in Alaska. And uh, I'm going to give you my conclusions, what we like the most, uh, what perhaps fell short. You know, it's a, a, on a regular trip, you know, there are some things that are going to be great and some things that are going to be perhaps not so great. But Alaska has definitely been one of those trips of a lifetime. And now the, the Canadian portion of this trip begins. We still don't know exactly what we're gonna do next. <laughs> After Vancouver, we don't know exactly what we're gonna do. But for sure we're going to Vancouver. Well, catch up with you this afternoon. I decided to go for another walk and um, you know, apparently there was an accident here. Oh no, that's never a good day. It's 
looks like it's going to be a while. Well, there was a little bit of excitement there with that uh, truck that got stuck in that hole. Uh, now we're gonna continue walking and see what we can find. There's supposed to be a, a welcome to, to Dawson City sign, and that's where we go. This one is called a tribute to the miner. We're going to take the trail that goes along the Yukon River. There's the Yukon Hotel, originally an office building and living quarters, constructed in 1898. Next to it, St. Paul's Anglican Church. And here's a monument dedicated to Dawson, who led the Yukon Survey Expedition. Apparently it is like a copy, a facsimile of the mammoth the prospectors found. Amazing creatures that no longer exist. There's the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and this building was the original territorial courthouse erected in 1901. Most of these historic buildings seem to be from the turn of the 20th century, which makes sense since the settlement was founded in 1897, when it became the center of the Klondike Gold Rush. I just wish you could visit all these buildings without needing a guided tour at a specific time. walking, admiring the town's colorful dwellings. The museum seems to be that way, and this is the town's power plant. Sign. Now we're going to walk back on 5th Avenue. This part, not quite as touristy, it feels more local, where the people actually live. And that noise you hear, that's the diesel power plant. Oh, look at that. Black residence. Pretty nice houses, huh? When there was money. Dawson City swimming pool. people swimming in there yeah they have like a swimming pool like a small water park back there it's like a community center if you will this is Minto Park check it out an old steam locomotive This would have been a cool one to visit. Unfortunately, it has a lock. Let's see, let's see if we can take another peek here. Yeah, pretty cool. Oh, that's the, the museum right there. Well, we were really tempted to go inside the museum, but besides not being in a terribly museum mood today, it is awfully hot in there. There's no air conditioner. And today it is one of those rare hot days here in Northern uh, Canada. Are we in Canada? Yeah, in the Yukon. <laughs> and uh, we're getting hungry and the restaurant is about to open. So we might do that. I guess this is cordoned off. We cannot see the... Los Cañones. 
Henry's. Next to the museum, we have the hospital. Fifth Avenue Bed and Breakfast. Very nice. And this house here, I don't know if it is part of it. We're definitely back in the touristy area with all the restaurants and hotels. Let's check out the Westmark Inn here. We're going to check out Kino Lounge on the second floor. The outside patio, it's very nice. But we're just gonna have a beer inside while we wait for the Greek restaurant to open. Conspiracy IPA from Yukon Brewing. And that's us on the mirror. Let's check this place out. Oh well, not very lively. Here we have an old photograph exhibit. Dawson, as they saw it. That's what I call an expedition bib. Look at those tires. I like it. Hair cabaret. Actually, I could use a haircut, having had one since Fairbanks. As I was saying, we're gonna have early lunch at the Drunken Goat. Another fat tug, as you do and delicious Greek food. <laughs> we came back to the sourdough for a nightcap, and this time the service was better. And serendipitously, we bumped into Josh and Pops of the YouTube channel Through My Lens. On the road again, today we have perhaps our longest driving day. And I see somebody's blocking the exit with their RV, so we're gonna have to uh, we can go around this way. Yeah, we haven't had a, a six-hour driving day in a long time. And, uh, yeah, the idea is to make it past Whitehorse. So, enjoy the ride. That we, this road we've never been on before, and the, and the drive on, on, on this particular roads we're going to take over the next three or four days are supposed to be even more beautiful than the Alaska Highway, so. And hopefully the road conditions are good because I'm kind of done with dirt roads, if you know what I mean. I spoke to someone uh, the, the, this morning, a viewer okay, from Oklahoma that I met here in the, at the RV park. And she said that the uh, oh look, stray dog. That um, uh, that highway, the Cassiar, is like no, not the Cassiar, the the Dempster Highway. That is really bad. So I'm glad we're not doing it. So let's put gas. In 400 meters, turn right onto Princess Street. Yeah, that's one of those big holes on the ground. I have to be careful. horse very picturesque we'll be back someday for sure because this is the road you take this is the the, 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 the beginning of the of the Dempster Highway anyway so <laughs> it's 199 per liter I have no idea whether that's good or bad but I have a feeling it's bad because uh, it took almost $150 to fill up the tank 
and uh, here in Canada, you, know, you have you have to select an amount of money that you want to put in the in the vehicle. And I selected a hundred bucks. You know, I thought, well, a hundred bucks, gotta fill it up. Mm, nope. <laughs> anyway, let's uh, let's get out of here. Let's get out of town. There's a an elevated vista point that we want to go to. Yeah, before we continue south, let's see the town from a higher perspective. And there is this viewpoint called Midnight Dome Lookout. It is said to be a popular place to witness the midnight sun, even though we're way below the Arctic Circle here, so the sun does set, even if ever so briefly during the solstice. It looks like there might be free camping up here. Maybe, as we reach the summit. And here we are. Yes, we can almost see the whole town from this vanish point and the Yukon River, and even the airport there on the left. There she is, the SS Kino. There's the old courthouse and the trail we walked along the Yukon River. Well, yeah, this spot right here is called Midnight Dome and it's about a, about a seven kilometer ride drive. There's a hiking trail too, by the way, uh, but you know, from Dawson City and what can I say? I would say it is a commanding view, wouldn't you agree? Kind of bummed out that it is still a little smoky, but I think it is getting better and hopefully as we head south, it'll improve. But um, yeah, I, I zoomed into town as you, as you saw and uh, you can see almost every landmark down there. It's uh, It's smoky. Well, now we continue. As I said, I, did I say destination Whitehorse? We're gonna see if we can boondog somewhere past Whitehorse. There's a couple of spots I've been looking at. And I mean, it's still not getting dark enough, but there might be a tiny chance to see the Northern Lights tonight. So I'll keep the cameras going. All right, let's go. We have a long drive, drive ahead of us. More than six hours, according to the GPS, which is gonna be all day. I mean, it is filthy. We need to go to an RV wash. Are you ready for a very long drive? Well, over the next three days, we're going to do 1,576 kilometers. Actually, a little more. That's almost 1,000 miles, so buckle up and enjoy the ride. Lots of road construction in this area, and it is not the smooth kind. Let's hope everything survives back there. I see some distant mountains, but with all this smoke, it is not exactly the most scenic drive.
Let's take a break. <sighs> that road was a lot worse than I expected, but hopefully everything survived. Fine in there. Oh, and the silver trail here, rest area, EV charging. And on this side here, we have a gas station. We're, we have a little over half a tank, but we're gonna fill up just in case. As I said, I had high expectations for this road and maybe it gets better farther south. Here we go, it is starting to look promising. Crossing once again the Yukon River. Let's refuel at one of these antique gas pumps. Usually a sign that we are pretty remote. There's a black bear in the middle of the road, but I couldn't get my zoom camera out in time, so this is the best I can do. Oh well. This is Fox Lake. We're getting close to Whitehorse. Here we are, arriving in Whitehorse, the capital of the Yukon Territory. We're only going to do one thing here today and that is get some groceries. We're running a little low. Let's see how this works. Oh, there you go. With that done, let's go find a place to spend the night. I think I found a pretty good spot, right next to a lake. This is, by the way, the Alaska Highway, so for the next 300 miles or so, we're going to be in familiar territory. We've been through here before, six weeks ago. Crossing the Yukon River one last time. Here at Jake's Corner, we're gonna take a detour onto Tagish Road towards our potential boondocking site. Here we go, this is called Little Atling Lake and there is supposed to be this parking lot with a boat ramp. I think this is it. Hmm, there's someone here. I'm going to ask him just to make sure it is okay to overnight here. Well, what do you guys think? This place showed up in freecampsites.net and I mean, 
freecampsites.net seldom disappoints when it comes to you know places like this that don't show up on the on the regular camping apps it's just a boat ramp here doesn't have any any signage saying that you know that overnight camping is uh, prohibited or anything like that and uh, I mean take a look at this place it's uh These mountains behind us and this lake. It's still a little bit smoky, but and there are more a few more bugs than I would like. But I think this is gonna be perfect. I'm gonna set up a camera doing a time lapse because I mean what are the chances? But there's a tiny tiny little chance we might be able to see the Aurora tonight. And it might be our, our last chance because we're going south pretty quickly. All right. Yeah, what a great discovery. It is just magical. And such a privilege to be able to go to sleep with this as our backdrop. These long sunsets of summer at high latitudes, they seem to last forever. At 10 p.m. the sun finally sets. Last night it almost got dark enough. But still, not quite dark enough to be able to see the northern lights.
Well, this was an awesome boondocking spot here. I forget the name of this lake. But um, yeah, the only negative is the bugs. There's a lot of bugs here. But you know, bugs don't make a distinction between Alaska or the Yukon. They're pretty much everywhere. Especially on this side, I mean, this, there's a swarming out there. It's, it's quite it's crazy. All right, we have about a four hour drive to Watson Lake. We're gonna make sure our sign is still there at the signpost forest and do a live stream. And uh, that's pretty much the plan for today. Hopefully, it's, uh, it looks like the smoke is clearing out a little bit, so it'll probably be a beautiful drive. Off we go. Alaska Highway, two kilometers to the right. We are once again on the Alaska Highway. Now crossing the Teslin River. We are now in the town called Teslin. I remember this place from where we were coming in the opposite direction. Let's stop off the tank and clean the windshield. Let's take a break. Well, that was a quick lunch break here. And I just realized we are now in British Columbia. And I just realized there's a view from the rest area. There's a lake back there. Still pretty smoky. We're straddling the line between British Columbia and the Yukon Territory. Next stop, Watson Lake, which is in the Yukon. These three fifth wheels are going super slow, even though the road is in great condition. So I'm stuck behind them until there is a long enough straight. And this is the junction we're going to take tomorrow to get on the Stuart Cassiar Highway. We've made it to Watson Lake and we're going to stay at the same place we stayed last time, downtown RV Park. They have a lot of Starlink friendly pull through RV sites. Here we are, 
the world famous signpost forest. Let's get lost. It's that way. I'm pretty sure it's that way. Because there was a boardwalk right in front of it. I see it. I see it. There's the pelican. Found it. Well, as you saw, I had a little bit of a hard time finding my own sign. You know, it's uh, this place is designed to to confuse you. You know, to to be like a like a labyrinth. But, um, but we found it. It's all the way back there. Maybe I'll put the GPS coordinates in the video description. So if you're here and you find it, take a picture. It tagged me on Instagram and or threads or Facebook, whatever you use. <sighs> on the road again. It's always nice to have a one night with full hookups, especially when you're planning on boondocking for one or two days in a row or three. I mean, we don't have the tanks to, 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 to boondock for more than three days, maybe. So uh, it is what it is. Um, and there are two ways to come to, to Alaska through Canada. One is the Alcan, the highway that is right in front of us there. But there's the other one, the, the Cassiar Stewart or Stewart Cassiar, which goes more like a straight south route. And that's where we're going today. We're going to Stewart and a small uh, Alaskan enclave. Well, it's not really an enclave, but it feels like one because there's no other way to get there called Hyder. So we're gonna fill up and get on the Cassiar. <laughs> I hope I didn't forget anything. I think we're good. We've got great weather and the smoke has dissipated a little, so this should be a great ride today. Here we turn south on Highway 37 towards Stewart. We are now officially in British Columbia. Well, we just entered British Columbia and it says 230 kilometers or kilometers, as they say, without fuel. Luckily, it says here that we have 387 of range. So. We're starting to see some mountains, and I think this leg of the trip is going to be very scenic. Let's check out Boya Lake Provincial Park here. It is supposed to have a very nice campground. Hmm, now what? I like it. Nice views and a path down to the lake. There had to be at least one Canadian RV, right? And the Winnebago. Let's turn around. I just wanted to see what it was like for a potential future trip and it is delightful. We'll definitely stop here next time.
let's get back on the main road. So far, they were right about the Stuart Cassier. This is a gorgeous scenic drive. Here we have an upside down truck camper on the right and the sign about the Cassiar Gold Rush on the left. Check it out, the butterfly thinks it is a real flower. It is gorgeous around here. Check out that hidden waterfall. We're approaching a small settlement called Jade City. The surrounding area is rich with serpentinite, greenstone and most importantly, nephrite jade, which during the summer months they sell here in the form of jewelry, carvings, even raw jade. Well, this is called Jade City and they have all this uh, jade rock here. A carving studio, I guess. They, they carve them and polish them and uh, yeah, we're not gonna do much. I guess this is how they cut them. Hmm. Let's walk a little farther, see what else there is. Oh wow, very smooth. According to their website, nephrite is the toughest of any natural stone. Hmm. The more you know. Let's see this bear statue here. No, not made out of jade. Some pretty cool mountains coming up. Nephrite is also translucent and smooth when polished. And all different shades of green. Oh wow, this is very, very, very smooth. I guess when they polish them, that's when they get that green color. We have a totem. Here we have some raw jade and some polished ones as well. And all kinds of different pieces. All right, that was cool. They have all kinds of cool stuff made out of jade. But we must continue going south. By the way, the smoke is almost clear now. It's a beautiful day here in British Columbia. We continue southbound. This here is called Joe Irwin Lake. So beautiful. Then again, in this area, everywhere you look, it is stunning. We're refueling at a town called Dees Lake. We're approaching the Alaska Boundary Range which means we're getting close to our destination for today. We're starting to see some snow-capped mountains once again. Beautiful lake. Actually, let's check out Kinaskan Lake Provincial Park. Pretty decent, if smallish, campground. Here we have this waterfront site, which is probably meant to be a boat ramp. Maybe, maybe not.
black bear alert! This time I have my zoom camera handy. And it is always a good day when you get to see wildlife. I'm sure this is the part of the drive everybody was talking about. It is gorgeous out here. And the wildlife plentiful. Here we have yet another black bear in the middle of the road. And this one, it's taking its time. Crossing the Bell Irving River. And check out this remote lodge. Coming up here on the left, it's a possible location to spend the night. This picnic area on the shore of Mehan Lake. It seems very nice. Well, this is gonna be our boondocking spot, but first of all, too many trees, no Starlink. And then this is kind of like a narrow road, so. We're about two hours away from um, a lot of mosquitoes too. We're about two hours away from Hyder, so I'm gonna keep on trucking. It is gonna drive for a little bit. Very well maintained road, by the way. I'm impressed. Oh, never forget to look back. Look at that. Here we are at a crossroads, arriving at Miziading Junction. We are on the home stretch for today. It is a beautiful drive on the 37A going towards Stuart, British Columbia. It is magnificent. Video doesn't really do it justice. Look at that glacier! I believe this one is called Bear Glacier. And according to what I've read, it's been retreating for many years. Let's get a little closer, maybe get a better view. Oh yeah, check that out! It is a stunning drive. Too bad the sun is right in front of us. This would be a much better drive in the morning.
just two miles away from Stuart, which is nestled in this gorgeous valley. Stuart here seems to be a pretty nice town, but that is not where we're going today. There's the border checkpoint, but you only have to stop on the way back to Canada. So here we are, Hyder, Alaska. Here we are, we made it to Hyder, Alaska. That's the Glacier Inn on the left. We'll be back. It is still early. It is surreal to finally be in this place I've read so much about and watched so many videos. This unique slice of the United States in Canada. This is it. This is the RV park, Camp Runamuck, it is called. And what we saw, it's also pretty much the whole town. There are some side streets and such, but you know what I mean. I don't recall how much this place was because I paid cash, but it was fairly cheap. Let's go get hydrized or something like that. Here we are. There is a no filming sign for no particular reason, but apparently still pictures are okay. It is completely deserted, so we're just gonna have an IPA and go home. Well, there was a sign saying no filming, so I just took a couple of pictures. It's a pretty unique bar today. There was no one there. I mean, it's a uh, Today's what? Saturday? Sunday? I don't even know. It's Saturday. You would think, right? Let's go back to the RV park. Tomorrow, we'll continue exploring. Well, good night. Hyder, Alaska. parking lot is full. Remote but very popular place. There seems to be additional parking farther down the road. Good 
Good morning. Parking lots full, so this place is uh, more popular than I thought. Wildlife viewing, 170 meters. Hmm, I guess we're using a mixture of metric and imperial around here. Hmm. Now we're the ones inside a cage. <laughs> I wonder why they call it Fish Creek. Oh, uh, look at all the salmon in the water. I think that's why. life that of the salmon swimming against the current only to get eaten by a bear here we have some ruins I don't really know what it is here we have some bear skin samples brown and black and as you can see black is not really black it's kind of dark brown and this is the main observation area Ranger said that bear activity has been slow. There was one grizzly this morning, but he left. Which is odd because salmon activity, as you can see, is very high. So um, maybe we'll get lucky. We may not get to see bears today, but the salmon and the seagulls, I mean, I believe they're seagulls, are pretty fascinating. The camera doesn't really capture it, but it is so beautiful out here. Yes, some of those shallow parts of the creek can be a death sentence for the swimming salmon. And a feast for the seagulls. Yeah, that one looks like it's dying. It's stuck. No, no, it's coming back. Okay. From July 1st through September 20th, in order to visit this place you need to purchase a pass at the Tongas National Forest website through recreation.gov. It is just $5 for a one-day pass. No. That does not look good for him. It is fascinating. Enthralling, I should say. Watching them struggle in the shallow water. And kind of sad, too. A wrong move could lead to their demise. But then again, they could get eaten by a bear, which arguably would be a faster, more humane death. No matter which way you put it, it is a hard life, that of the salmon. It's too shallow.
the bird is there waiting for it. We could spend all day here, watching the salmon struggle, waiting for a bear to show up, but we're going to continue. Well, yeah, plenty of salmon, but no bear, so we're going to go see the glacier. We'll be back in the afternoon or around noon, I don't know, sometime. Just a few feet past Fish Creek, the road turns into dirt. It is going to be a dusty ride. Oh no, construction coming up. And there is supposed to be this rather large mining operation on the Canada side. Yes, by the way, we're going back into Canada. Technically, we're back Welcome in Canada. Welcome to Canada. Oh, thank you. We're back in Canada. Well, almost. There we go. The speed limit sign in kilometers is a clear sign we are no longer in the United States. There is no border checkpoint or customs or anything like that since the only way to get here is on this road, which actually comes from Canada anyway. I was investigating and it seems to be a gold mine, right here, in what is called the Golden Triangle of Northwestern British Columbia. There seems to be a lot of gold in this area. Let's take a quick look. Look at that. Yes, you can see the mine from here. And it is huge. Wow. Yep. We continue on this dusty road. Yay, expedition vehicle! Here's our first glimpse at Salmon Glacier. The first of many, I'm sure. This is just the toe of the glacier, just a very small part. Every few hundred yards or so, you feel compelled to stop or slow down and admire the striking scenery before your eyes. And we've been blessed with such great weather today. Check out this view. Somewhere down there, crossing the river, is the border with Alaska. But nature doesn't seem to care which country it belongs to. It is all gorgeous around here. They don't look like much from afar, but as you zoom in, you realize those are some amazing waterfalls.
we're starting to get some stunning views of the glacier now. And even though this is not the official viewing point, we're gonna stop. We are very close though. Standing on the edge. Look at the surface, all fractured, cracked. Here's from a slightly different vantage point. That's the way to do it, helicopter tour. I was beginning to question the wisdom of driving on that grueling dirt road all the way up here. A whole hour. But I think it was worth it. I mean, the camera will never do justice to actually standing up here on this rock, but... That's an incredible sight. Well, the mosquitoes up here are relentless, but yeah, definitely, definitely worth the view from up here. Let's see if we can get all the way down there. There must be a helicopter base somewhere nearby. I'm glad I didn't fly the drone. Very similar view from down here. But you can see more of the dirty edge, I guess. And there it goes downhill. The road keeps going for a few more miles, so let's see how far we can go. It is a stunningly beautiful drive. Definitely a fitting end to our time in the frontier. Yes, because after this, we're going south. Here's from a slightly different angle. You gotta stop often because everywhere you look, there is a magnificent view. I mean, look at that waterfall. And here's an even better angle. I wonder where all that water goes. This is. I see no information anywhere about this tunnel, so do comment if you know what this is. Let's continue on this road a little longer, which according to Google Maps it is called Grand Duck Road. I 
think this is where we're going to turn around. According to the map, the road dead ends at a mining camp in about a mile anyway, so let's turn around. Hello there. Here's a different view. Another toe, perhaps, on this side. What a drive! And the road is a little rough in parts, but I think pretty much any vehicle could make it. I mean, I wouldn't tow a fifth wheel on it because of the tight turns, or a Class A for that matter, but as far as ground clearance, it is not bad. Not bad at all. We're getting close to the viewpoint. Magnificent. I'm running out of adjectives here. Anyway, let's stop one more time. So the chopper landed down there. Maybe it is like a hiking tour or something like that? More research shall go into this, because we might be back in a couple of years when we decide to do the Dempster Highway. Yes, we're already planning another trip to the Arctic. We just can't get enough of this place. That's the actual toe of the glacier. I guess it melts into this river here. Look at that. I just realized this is the same river we saw earlier. The one that eventually straddles the border. A lot more people coming now, and it is so dusty. Let's get a better view of the mine. The mine. I really hope they know what they're doing. We're about to cross the border. Salmon Glacier self-guided tour. Premier border crossing. Let's get back to Hyder, get hitched up and continue the journey south. I don't think we're going back to Fish Creek. I didn't turn on the rooftop GoPro, so we don't really have any footage of the border crossing. And let me tell you, sometimes they really grill you with questions. So many waterfalls in these mountains.
Of course, we had to stop one more time to see Bear Glacier. And it is magnificent. Here we have yet another black bear, like bidding us farewell. Perhaps our last encounter of the trip, because we're heading south rather swiftly. Destination, Vancouver. Eventually, it is going to take us a little over two days to get there. And there are a few things to see along the way, so buckle up and enjoy the ride. It was only a matter of time before we got some rain. All of a sudden, it feels like we are in a much more developed area. There's cattle, farmland, and at this point, we're actively looking for a place to spend the night. Here we have a rest area as we approach Smithers, but it clearly says no camping or overnight parking, so we're going to have to look elsewhere. There's another rest area coming up, and this one seems to be pretty large. Oh yeah, I don't see any signage about no overnight, so I think this is it. Well, here we are, this is a rest area. Finally found one that doesn't have any no overnight uh, camping signs. So I believe this is what we're gonna call it. It's pretty scenic. Tomorrow we'll probably stay at Prince Rupert. I don't know yet. But in any case. Good night. See you tomorrow. I'll leave there. I'll probably leave a time lapse going. See if we if we see if we can see anything. You know, there's supposed to be northern lights happening <laughs> these these days. I'm tired. I've driven more, I mean, it is, it is 7 p.m. Pacific. I've driven more than, than I had planned. Good night. It's filling up pretty good. I'm glad we got here early. It actually got dark last night, but too much light pollution. Good morning. This was certainly a pretty quiet night, uh, considering, you know, we're right next to the main highway here. And uh, I was hoping we, we, we might be able to see the northern lights, but too much light pollution. There's street lights, so yeah. But it's a, it's a beautiful setting here, actually. And it's probably the one uh, rest area that doesn't have a no overnight uh, a parking sign. So that's why we stayed here. It's the Bulkley View rest area. We have mountains over there, mountains. Uh, anyway, we're going towards uh, Prince, Prince George today. And maybe even a little farther than that. Yeah, never fails. The whole rest area and they park blocking me. 
God forbid we walk an extra 10 steps to go to the bathroom. That is pretty dense fog. Stopping at Walmart to resupply and A&W for lunch. I don't have to tell you, it's been a long drive. Oh no, it's getting a little smoky again. Let's check out this rest area to possibly overnight. It is very small. No, I don't think this is gonna work. Eventually we arrive at a town called Quesnel. Quenel, it is pronounced, I later found out. There is a downtown RV park and we were able to make a reservation online. It's still kind of early, so we might get a chance to walk around and explore a little bit. We're really hightailing it south, aren't we? But we are in Quisnell. Uh, this is the Quisnell downtown RV park. Very easy to book online. Uh, in fact, there's not even like a check-in process. The, the camp host just came uh, out with a you know, bunch of papers, you know, rules and stuff like that. We are walking distance to downtown. There's a river trail. And uh, this was 46.95 Canadian, which turned out to be 34.45. US or something like that. There's only one electric. There's a dump station, a municipal dump station. Uh, so you get out. This place looks brand new. I mean, that's the one. Well, it's, and it's perfect. No trees, so it's good for Starlink. Unless you want trees, you, you book on the other side. And, uh, I really wanted to boondock today, boondock one more time, you know, one more day in a row here. And we do have the tank capacity and the battery capacity for it. Except that it is very too hot. It's getting uncomfortably hot to 
to boondock you know i'm sure it's gonna cool down overnight but right now it's like 30 degrees celsius which i'm not exactly how much it is in fahrenheit but it feels hot in the sun so um yeah we might go for a little walk in downtown but today is british columbia day so a lot of things might be closed but yeah i'm tired so it's gonna be a nice break to spend the night here and tomorrow we continue towards vancouver We happen to be right next to a rail yard. But I guess it wouldn't be a proper RV park if it wasn't right next to a railroad track, right? Let's go for a walk. There's a brewery in town. This is the pedestrian walkway that goes over the railroad tracks. Yeah, it is noisy. Well, it wouldn't be us if we didn't find the one brewery in town and there is walking distance. That's where we're going first, Barkerville Brewery. There's Minitini, number four. Barkerville, by the way, is a historic mining town about an hour drive east of here. Not a whole lot of people here on a Monday. I mean, it might be early. Cheers. All right, next up, there's a casino like three blocks that way, so that's where we're going next. Here's the Quenelle Cenotaph, originally erected in 1922 to honor the town's fallen servicemen and women. Here we have a statue of a miner at the Billy Barker Casino parking lot. Pretty cool. It kind of looks like C-3PO. Well, what happens in the casino stays at the casino. But I just say we just spent all of our Canadian money, all the money we had left, which wasn't all that much, so that's a good thing. I like the architecture of the casino. It looks like an old riverboat. The casino is named after William Billy Barker, an English prospector who in 1862, well, he and his crew struck the lead at a depth of 52 feet near Barkerville. And as the story goes, that started an industrial revolution that literally helped build British Columbia. Who knew? Lots of history here in Quenelle. And this wasn't really part of the plan, this was totally serendipitous. But now, I'm so glad we decided to stay here because now we know it exists, and we might visit in more depth in the future. This rebuilt Cornish water wheel was originally located at Peters Creek in the 1890s, and it was connected to a pump and a winch to raise buckets of ore when the surface gold became depleted. It was brought here in 1930 to form part of this memorial, Heritage Corner. Here's also what remains of the boiler and the crankshaft of one SS Enterprise. Not the one you're thinking about. The SS Enterprise. The first stern wheeler. And there's a picture here. Here's the also historic wooden pedestrian bridge, allegedly the longest wood truss walking bridge in the world. And there is a pub on the other side. I don't know if we should go. There is um, the world's largest gold pan, but I think we're gonna see that tomorrow on the way out. Pretty cool town, I didn't know it was so historic. We shall return someday, as I usually say. Yeah, Billy Barker is omnipresent in this town. Well, we came back. We like this place. Cheers. The brewery was a little more lively this time, meaning there was one other person besides us. But 
is close to the RV park, and all that walking around made us thirsty. It turns out there's a river walk, so since the days are still long, we're going to go to the confluence of the Quenelle and Fraser rivers. It is called Letico Dene Park, named after the Letico Dene tribe, the original settlers of this area. There's a pretty swift current down there, let me tell you. Look at that. See, this is the riverfront trail. We are here and we're going here to the confluence. And this is it. Confluence. Yes, the sun will soon set, but I am very glad we decided to do this trail. And this is it, the confluence. We've made it, and the sun is gone. And yes, this is the confluence of the Fraser and the Quesnel River. And, uh, I wish I would have brought the drone because I'm sure you could t tell a difference in the color of the water as they merge together. But uh, maybe tomorrow morning we'll just do a quick flight. Well, the sun's setting somewhere back there, so let's get back before it gets dark. One last panoramic look. Swift current. Well, good morning. Well, Quesnel, is that how you pronounce it? Quesnel here, uh, it was a pleasant surprise. Nice, nice small town. I mean, I mean, there's not a whole lot to do, but it's a nice small town. Now we're gonna go to the dump station. It's a municipal free dump station. And then we're gonna see the world's largest gold pan. Yeah, it's totally a thing. <laughs> and then we continue driving south. It is very nice for municipalities to have affordable city campgrounds, free dump station. It makes you feel welcome. There's also free daytime RV parking and potable water, which is a nice touch as well. It has started to rain, but we had to come see the world's largest gold pan. Well, right here by the Quesnel Depot is the site of the world's largest gold pan. Is it everything we're expecting? It certainly is. And uh, yeah, well, we continue. We continue driving south. And yes, I know it is pronounced Quenel. It is going to be a long drive on the Caribou Highway. I don't know why, but the navigation has taken us on these back roads, presumably to avoid Williams Lake, maybe there is traffic, but it is perhaps the most scenic part of the drive so far. We even have cows on the road. And we're back on the Caribou Highway. It 
looks like the drive is about to get a lot more scenic as we begin to approach the foothills of the coast mountains. I suddenly start seeing a resemblance to Washington and Oregon, the part just east of the Cascades. This area must have very similar climate. It is a striking landscape. The contrast of the dark green with the beige and brown, it is very peculiar. This has certainly turned into an unexpectedly scenic drive. $155 to fill up. That was the... Well, we were running on fumes too. Now, it is starting to look like coastal Washington and Oregon. We must be in a more rainforest-like climate. We're finally arriving in Hope, British Columbia. This happens to be the filming location of First Blood, the first Rambo movie, which, after Scarface, may be one of my favorite movies of the early 80s. And the main reason we're stopping here. It is a breathtaking location, surrounded by all these mountains. This is where we're staying. It is called Coquihalla Campsite.
this is our site, just for one night. I'm not even gonna unhitch since everything we want to see is walking distance. Yeah, no Starlink here. There's no way. Anyway, Hope uh, was the filming location for First Blood, also known as the first Rambo movie. And as a child of the 80s, we have to check it out, right? I like those little fifth wheels. Gateway to Holiday Land. Yeah, that looks like the sign from the movie. Or is it? Is it me or does that sign show up in the movie? Anyway, the first thing we're gonna see is the bridge, which the original no longer is, exists, but it is almost at the exact location. The wooden sign, if you rewind and look closely, is a slightly different font, so... Nope, not the original. Hey, check it out, this is it. The old bridge was demolished and replaced in 2011. But still, it might be fun to walk on the new one. If you ask me, the old bridge had a lot more character, but I guess it wasn't good and they replaced it. Let's see, because according to a video I saw, you can still see part of the old bridge somewhere here. Where could it be? That's all that remains of the original bridge. So yeah, this would have been John Rambo minding his own business, walking into town only to get arrested and uh, and the rest is film history. <laughs> now, we are, we are kind of hungry, just like Rambo was, but luckily nowadays there's a brewery in town, so we're gonna check it out. Beer bites, growlers on flights. <sighs> 40 minutes later, here's our huge burrito. <sighs> well, they took forever, but that was certainly a great burrito. We got the brisket burrito and yeah, not like your classic seven layer burrito. No, it would have had like cabbage and lettuce and all that. It was good. Well, apparently somewhere around here, I don't think this overpass was here in, in, the, in 1981, but uh, somewhere around, around here was the sign that said, you know, gateway to, um, to Wonderland, to Holidayland, and, uh, and the Welcome to Hope sign. Let's walk down this street to, to see the, the very spot where uh, Rambo encounters the policeman. Yeah, I have a feeling the town has changed quite a bit in the past uh, 40 years. Yeah, this right here is the entrance to the town. Tell you what, I should have re-watched the movie before coming here because I don't know exactly, I don't recall exactly the angle but I do believe this is the very spot where Rambo meets uh, the sheriff for the first time and it was probably looking that way of course it looks different uh, 40 years later anyway here they have a, a Chevy dealer now Yeah, wood carvings seem to be a thing here. Here's looking back towards the entrance of town. And there's a visitor center here on the right, but it is kind of late. Here they have a Rambo cutout. So you can take a picture. Looking like Rambo. That's the visitor center. It's a trailer, but there's another wood carving right there. Let's go by the Fraser River really quick. There is some kind of memorial. 
The pyramid marks the approximate location of a former fort, Fort Hope National Historic Site of Canada. As a sheriff. This is Memorial Park, and there are wood carvings everywhere. Well, there's a carving of the sheriff from the movie, Will Tissel. I believe Rambo is back there. It doesn't really look like him, but <laughs> there he is. Hello there. Well, after the Rambo carving, we have one more, just one more point of interest here in town. I mean, there are many other uh, filming locations, but we're just gonna see one more. Which, by the way, very picturesque town. I mean, we, we are surrounded by mountains everywhere. <laughs> no wonder they chose this as the, as the filming location. Some very large trees here at Memorial Park. We continue roaming the lonely residential streets of Hope, hoping we might find another film and location. What else might we find here? And I think that's it. That tall tree. Well, this is what is known as the H tree, H, the letter H, and it was featured uh, prominently well, for a few seconds in that, uh, you know, motorcycle chase scene in the movie. Let's see if there's any uh, signage. In 40 years, the bottom has filled up a little, and now it's more like a narrow V, but I'm glad it's still here. I don't know the exact spot, but these are the railroad tracks. Here we have another wood carving interesting Volkswagen bug and yet another wood carving the Hope Curling Club doesn't get any more Canadian than that eh? actually I read the sport was created in Scotland but nowadays it's totally a Canadian thing I don't know why that melody came to my mind. And we're back at the campground. Tomorrow we continue towards Vancouver. Good morning. We're going to Vancouver, which we've been there before, but ever so briefly. Um, and I'm afraid the adventure is almost over. At least the adventure part of the adventure. We're gonna do, you know, one more... Maybe we'll do like a Great Canadian Cities series at some point. 
and Vancouver, I think, it certainly qualifies. Um, and then we're going back to the lower 48, back to home base. But anyway, enjoy the ride. I'm sure we're going to enjoy Vancouver tremendously. Not to mention oil change, phone repair, uh, Amazon packages, that sort of thing. That sort of big city thing you need from time to time. Here we are, arriving at the Vancouver metropolitan area. And the only place where we could find vacancy on short notice was Burnaby Caribou RV Park, in Burnaby, which is a city east of Vancouver. Still, close enough, with access to public transit if needed, so not so bad. This is probably the tightest site I have ever had to back into. Well, it is certainly one of the tightest spots we've ever stayed at. I keep saying it and I never do it. I'm gonna start lying about my length. <laughs> no, apparently here at the at the office they sell tickets for the public transit so let's get let's get those yeah i had to park in this parking lot back here well both minitini and starship need a a good wash and they do have a a, a car wash bay here at the army park which by the way this is the tightest <laughs> place i've seen i mean all all these sites especially if you have like a it's like a like a large slide out it's kind of like yeah <laughs> All right, now we're leaving for real. It's about a 1.3 kilometer, 15 minute walk to, to the metro. I think it's called the, the Sky Tram or something like that. Yeah, so yeah, we're going to downtown using public transportation. The RV park is close to many outdoor activities, the Brunette River here and Burnaby Lake. And it feels kind of strange being back in a big city after such a long time on the fringes of civilization. Here we are at Production Way University Station and we're taking the Millennium Line and then the Expo Line. Alright, so... I have no idea where we are. Anyway, we purchased something called a Compass Card and got a day pass, which I believe is valid for all local forms of public transit. The TransLink public system. I really like this elevated rail system. It is a great way to see the city from above. Over the past few decades, Vancouver has earned the nickname City of Glass. In part because of all these high-rise apartment buildings and glass canopies over sidewalks. All these high-rise residential buildings are part of an urban planning movement coined Vancouverism. Here we are going to transfer to the Expo Line, to Waterfront. Here's a perfect example of the aforementioned Vancouverism. The city certainly has a unique look, and all the glass has this subtle light teal hue. Very interesting. Anyway, we're arriving in downtown and from here we're going to take the C-Bus to Lonsdale Key 
for what is sure to be a great vantage point from where to see some of the best views of the city skyline. The gentleman who checked me in at the RV park actually recommended we do this. And here we are on the sea bus, which is basically a ferry running constantly, moving people across Vancouver Harbor. And the good news? It looks like the weather is going to improve. We have blue skies in the forecast for the next few days. That's North Vancouver, where we're going. And that looks like it might be Burnaby, where we came from. And here we are at the Lonsdale Key Market. This is the view of downtown. And we have love locks. Of course, we have a huge cargo ship partially blocking our view. And there goes the sea bus. And we have a large cruise ship leaving port as well. Here comes a float plane. I mean, it probably just landed, but float planes are so cool. We have to get on one of those again. Yeah, let's check out the indoor market. Yes, very nice. It is not particularly lively right now, but I kind of prefer it this way. Let's get on the elevator to the lower level. Chocolate, ice cream, restaurants, all kinds of things. Too bad we're not hungry yet, so let's go back out. That's a nice mega yacht. Let me tell you, I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind at all. I see hints of blue sky. That is a very good sign. There's again our mega yacht. And now we have a slightly less obstructed view of downtown. And wildlife. And here we are now walking on this pier. This, uh, this area here, the, the key, the queue, or the key, I think it's, it's, it's called. Very nice and great views of downtown. Uh, I'm glad the gentleman at the, at the RV park recommended we, we take that uh, seat, seat, no, water taxi, you know, it's called a sea bus here. And now eventually we're gonna take the sky train back. But let me show you, the view from here is even better. Here we have more of these high-rise buildings with the slightly tinted glass windows. I like the look. It seems like a great area to spend an afternoon, lots to see and do, restaurants, bars and the huge trumpet. There is one big trumpet. <laughs> and that's it. We're heading back on the sea bus.
Telekom. We are now going to a neighborhood called Gastown, the site of the original settlement that eventually became Vancouver. It is most famous for its unique steam clock, but first, we're hungry. And thirsty for that matter, so we're going to Steamworks Brewing Company. We really liked this place the last time we were here. I forgot to film the food, but we had some poutine, as you do in Canada, among other things. Now let's go check out the steam clock. Gas down here, very hip and touristy, although there seems to be a little bit of a drug addiction and homelessness problem as well. And here we have it, the famous gas clock. Not as old as it looks. It was built in 1977 to cover a steam grate, part of Vancouver's heating system. We can see the original steam engine through the glass that originally powered the clock. But since 1986, the clock has actually run on electricity. The steam is only used for the chimes. I was kind of disappointed to find that out. Very cool to see this clock once again. Last time we were here, it was in 2019. We're gonna start walking back to the SkyTrain station. And there is also an observation deck we want to see. Well, we were gonna go up to the Vancouver Tower, but it closed at 7, so... Let's just come here, to the end of this parking lot, and see the view. And then we're just gonna take the SkyTrain back to Burnaby. There's one more view across Vancouver Harbor. This is such a picturesque and photogenic city. And the sun's coming out. I think tomorrow we're going to have great weather. We got on the Expo Line back. It is a little bit of a longer ride, but we don't have to change trains and we'll be able to see different parts of the city. This line also goes through less densely populated neighborhoods. So far, SkyTrain seems to be a great way to get a lay of the land and go around the city. Well, it's been, it's been mostly a utilitarian day. We went this morning for an oil change, then did a much needed car wash, and now we're gonna go fix uh, my phone screen. Yeah, I dropped it the other day on the Denali Highway. And, uh, and maybe then we'll visit a couple of places that are more suitable to visit with the car, since we're already, you know, gonna be driving. Might as well, right? All right. Enjoy the big city ride. 
We're going to this big shopping mall called Metropolis at Metrotown, and there's a smartphone repair shop called Mobile Clinic. I made an appointment, so let's see what they say. Deja vu. We passed by here on the Sky Train yesterday. Houston, we have a problem. Clearance 66 or 198. Starship is 67 tall or just over 2 meters. This parking garage is definitely not made for high pickup trucks, so let's look for a plan B. Even though I memorized my height in metric, I am glad they have it on Imperial too, just in case. I guess too many American tourists scraped the roof. Here we have another parking garage and this one is 75 or 226, so we're good. Now let's find parking. Beautiful mall, but needless to say, this was an epic fail. I'll tell you about it later. Oh yeah, I don't know if I told you, but I broke my phone a couple of days ago and uh, the phone repair thing was an epic fail. <laughs> uh, even though, you know, I made an appointment, you know, I think appointments don't really work here because Chevrolet didn't really have my appointment, my appointment either. So I don't know what's going on. In any case, they didn't have the, the Samsung screen. So I'm just gonna fix it when I get to, the, to, to Florida. But right now we're gonna take an Uber and, uh, and actually explore different parts of town. That's the plan anyway. By the way, even if the repair shop would have had the part, since my Samsung S23 is manufactured for sale in the United States, their screen made for Canada wouldn't be compatible. The more you know. Well, Uber driver dropped us off here at uh, Commercial Drive, so we're gonna see, there's a it's called Havana, Vancouver. It's a Cuban restaurant. <laughs> well, to begin, the mojitos are really good. We ordered brava potatoes, which is more of a Spanish dish, and croquettes. croquettes de we also got the mussels in Creole sauce, which was delicious. <laughs> Well, as many of you know, I was born in Havana, Cuba, so whenever I see a place with the name of my birthplace, you know, we gotta try it, right? And let me tell you, Havana, Vancouver here did not disappoint. The food was excellent. And the mojito, I mean, I gotta say, it, it almost rivals those of the Key West. Of course, here they make it with authentic Havana Club rum, which it's illegal in the United States, but here in Canada, you know, you can you can import it from, from Cuba, so. I don't know, it was really good. Here, they have these colorful crosswalks. Well, I guess this is Little Italy. 
have the electric buses and overall very cool neighborhood actually. Lots of places to eat. It is like the League of Nations here on this street when it comes to food options. And here we have a British phone booth. Look at a phone. Well, as you saw, very picturesque uh, neighborhood here. Now we're gonna take an Uber somewhere else in town. Somewhere we've been before, actually. Look at all those people dressed in white. I wonder what that is. Well, this is where we're going. Granville Island. Well, the idea was to come to Granville Brewing Company, but it is closed. Again, <laughs> as it was four years ago. Must not be, must not be in the books for us to, to visit this place. But we're on Granville Island and uh, let's walk around a little bit and check it out. It's a very picturesque part of town. The keg, that's what we ate the last time we were here. Of course, Canada and the United States may be the most similar two countries in the world. I mean, we, we almost feel like at home here, except everything is in metric. Certain words are spelled differently. Sometimes you see the occasional Canadian flag and then the posty. Yeah, their, their mailboxes are different too. But uh, other than that, you know, same language, almost same accent, and uh, it feels very much like at home here. This body of water is a narrow inlet called Falls Creek. It turns out, when they were first surveying the area in the mid-1800s, they thought it was a creek. And when they realized it wasn't a creek, they called it Falls Creek. And the name stuck. We are enjoying such perfect weather today. <laughs> Granville Island here used to be an industrial area with factories, warehouses, now turned into this entertainment complex. We've decided we're going to take one of those boats, which you can take from point A to point B, like a bus, or you can do the whole loop around the inlet, which is what we're doing. Off we go. Vancouver has some very cool modern architecture, let me tell you. Here again. Oh 
That sphere we've seen several times now, by the way, is called Science World. It is a science children's museum. the people dressed in white again. I believe this is an annual event called Dinner en Blanc, a tradition that began in Paris in 1988 and nowadays is celebrated in several cities around the world. You're supposed to bring your own folding table and chairs and white tablecloth, cutlery and of course the food. It is, I guess, like a giant potluck except for the fact that you don't get to share the food. I don't really get the concept, but obviously many people do because they're receiving a waiting list. That's BC Place, a retractable roof stadium. Very cool. It must be really cool to live in a city surrounded by mountains. Lots of outdoor activities available for sure. I hear it is ridiculously expensive to live here though. There's Science World once again. That's Vancouver Lookout, the tower that we couldn't visit yesterday. Check it out, wildlife! Very cool houseboats. I mean, houseboats are always cool. Sadly, our cruise around Falls Creek is coming to an end, but we've enjoyed it tremendously. Here's a cement plant disguised with graffiti art, a work called Giants by Brazilian twins Os Gemelos. Well, that was a super fun round trip on the aqua bus. Uh, you know, everything is cool when you're on the water. Now, um, let's go somewhere else. Our Uber is coming. Anyway, we're going to an area called English Bay Beach. Well, so we made it to this other part of town, West End here. And let's see what we can see. Palm trees in Canada. Who would have thought? By the way, we've been here before. 
back in our very brief visit in 2019. And here's a sculpture called Amazing Laughter. I call it the Laughing People Sculpture. The name is of course a play on the words maze and amaze to create amazing laughter. Get it? The plaque reads, may this sculpture inspire laughter, playfulness and joy in all who experience it. Equally cool is that large tree on top of that building. It is very cool to see all the Vancouverites enjoying this exceptionally good weather. Here we have some live music. It is a brass band. Well, English beach here definitely happening and uh, yeah, we got palm trees in Canada, who would have thought? <laughs> yeah, it's a cool place. Let's, uh, let's find something to drink. We're thirsty. Let's check it out. Craft here looks promising. Found a spot at the bar, good IPA. And it looks like we might even be able to enjoy the sunset from here. Came back down to the beach for a sunset. It is pretty spectacular actually. Well, good morning. Oh, I'm losing my voice. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, we're going to what's arguably one of the biggest tourist attractions here in the Vancouver area. It's called uh, Capilano Suspension Bridge. 23 minute drive and we pre-purchase tickets. So enjoy the ride.
And here we are, Capilano Suspension Bridge Park. I was a far stranger when I married Elizabeth. Now I joined this creek. Here we get a little bit of history about the property, which has been privately owned since Scottish civil engineer and land developer George Grant Mackay purchased 6,000 acres of dense forest on either side of the Capilano River back in 1888 and built a cabin on the very edge of the canyon wall. The following year, Mackay suspended a footbridge made from hemp rope and cedar planks across the canyon, which was upgraded over the years to what it is today. By 1893, it was a popular destination with locals and eventually it became the tourist attraction that it is today. Here we are on the bridge. The only bottleneck is all the people trying to take pictures, some of them every 10 seconds. I mean, it is a beautiful setting. So we just take a deep breath and wait. Well, yeah, this is us walking on the... <clears throat> I still don't have, don't have my voice, voice back. This is us walking on the famous Capilano Bridge here and... Uh, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty long way down. And it bounces a lot. <laughs> On the other side, they're selling something called Otter Balls. I gotta try it. Oh, check it out. They're like mini pancakes. Uh, let's uh, do the three tops adventure. By the way, Otter Balls, not necessarily a big fan. It's fine, but I probably wouldn't get them again. <laughs> These are some pretty massive trees. They almost, uh, almost look like the California redwoods. So uh, let's do the three tops adventure. Let's see how it is. Extreme nature ahead. It's not a redwood, but it is pretty massive. Yep, it is a pretty long way down. This is very cool, very um, different. But, you know, you have to wait for people to take pictures. Uh, that long. Well, there are supposed to be otters here, but I don't see any. Two hundred and fifty feet, seventy-six meters is the tallest tree in the forest. One thousand three hundred years. Oh, let's see what this is. Ooh, birds. This is a Harris hawk. He's eleven years old. He's a pound and a half. 
Oh, and they have an owl too. They're such fascinating birds. It is a buried owl. <laughs> well, hello there. Well, that was really cool seeing the birds, especially the, the, the barrel owl. They're, they're such unique creatures, right? She, 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 he can, like, you know, twist his neck all the way around, like, like, like the girl in The Exorcist, kind of. Very interesting birds. There's the suspension bridge once again, and we're gonna get back on it soon. And that's the Capilano River down there. This is such a beautiful area, and so close to the city too. getting really crowded now. I really hope this bridge does not have a weight limit. Oh, that's the cliff walk down there. Let's go do it. Oh yes, it is very narrow. And if you have a fear of heights, don't do it. We can see the bridge from here. Actually, it is a lot less crowded now. Check it out, the cascade. Yeah, yeah it is a long way down. <laughs> Check that out. It is a long way down there and that tree almost seems impossible that it can exist there. You know, hanging on to your life to that cliff. This is very cool. Here we are. Check out that waterfall. I usually say the camera will never do it justice. <laughs> this one totally looks man-made, but still cool. All right, just for scale. This is me against the tree. Well, yeah, the whole park, very cool. They have a lot of activities, you know, or information, more like educational, geared towards children and stuff, so it would be a good place to, to, to come with the family. But we're all, we liked it. And there is live music. Please set me free. I'm under your spell. 
that music is always good. Now let's go to a different place. A geographical oddity. And you know I'm really into those. And spoiler alert, for that we have to go back into the United States of America. I'll let you know soon. Very nice residential neighborhood here. Totally getting San Francisco vibes from this street right here. It is about an hour drive to where we're going. This peculiar exclave called Point Roberts, which, when they drew the border back in the mid 19th century, the tip of this peninsula found itself south of the 49th parallel. So, by treaty, it belonged to the United States. And that's how it stayed. Here we are at the border crossing. Even though we are now in the US, gas is still priced in liters and they give you both the price in Canadian and US dollars. Which reminds me, we have to put gas. Let's begin by going to the southern tip of the peninsula, which is called Lighthouse Marine Park. That's probably the ferry that goes to Victoria, which we want to take. We've made it to Point Roberts, which is this geographical oddity, if you will, just um, a piece of the United States trapped at the bottom of this peninsula, just because it is south of the parallel. So, yeah, let's see if this is the lighthouse trail. I don't think there is a lighthouse, but we'll see. I wonder what this is. Okay, so that was a remaining piece of the original lighthouse here. So that's Whatever new that thing is, that's the new lighthouse. Such beautiful weather again today. I think this is as far as we're gonna go. Yeah, it's been a very peaceful stroll, but we're kinda hungry. And there seems to be one restaurant open in town at this time of the day, which is just, uh, it's 12.30 in the afternoon. We're gonna check it out. It's called the Saltwater Cafe. By the way, this is called the Whale Trail and uh, Rumor has it that sometimes you get to see whale out here. I mean, there is a gentleman with one, one of those big telescopes gazing at the horizon, so you never know. We might get to see something. Remember the gentleman with the Airstream Argosy we encountered in Alaska? I mean, I know it's not the same rig, but what are the chances? These old Argosies are not very common, so it is cool to encounter two on the same trip. That's it, coming up here on the right. By the way, most people seem local. I don't think Point Roberts gets much tourism. 
but I could be wrong. Yep, not in Canada anymore. <laughs> but what a unique place, the Point Roberts here. We got the Cuban panini. It's a pretty thick Cuban. Well, it took a little longer than expected, but that was tasty. Let's uh, let's check out the the Rift Tavern over there, and then uh, we we'll continue. Perhaps we should linger longer next time, because the tavern opens when the cafe closes. Monday, Thursday, Monday, Tuesday, and Friday at 4 p.m. Saturday and Sunday at noon. Here's the view from the beach, and it is such a peaceful place. And it being so isolated by the border crossing, crime is non-existent here. It's been called the best gated community in the USA. And that's the ferry terminal. All right, let's continue. I guess they open up when the cafe closes. <laughs> Maybe it's the same owner, <laughs> for all we know. There is one more thing we want to see, and that is Monument Park, where there is a monument. You'll see it in a minute. Well, I've been wanting to come to this place for a very long time. Technically, it is illegal for me to cross that yellow little barricade because actually right now I'm standing in two countries at the same time. That over there is Canada and that house, of course, they even have the flag to prove it. And here we have this sign and this is the marker. I, mean, I don't even know if I'm supposed to touch it, but this is exactly the 49th parallel that divides Canada from the United States and of course this is Point Rogers, uh, Washington and that's, I forget the name of the city but it's part of British Columbia and uh, here, this is called Monument Park and actually Starship, that tire might be in Canada and the rest of Starship might be in the United States and um, yeah this is uh, the monument this is the monument marking the 49th parallel. Let's check it out up, up close. This is so cool. Yeah, on June 15th, 1886, Great Britain and the United States of America established the 49th parallel as the border between the United States and Canada. And that's the reason why Point Roberts exists, because this peninsula, you know, was cut in half by the 49th parallel. Latitude 49. And this is it. <laughs> so yeah, technically right now I'm trespassing into Canada. Of course, of course we're gonna go back through the actual border and uh, here's a sign saying let me see if I can show you. You can even see the screen. Yeah, warning. You're entering the United States without, if you're entering the United States without presenting yourself to an immigration officer, you may be arrested and prosecuted. Isn't this like the most unique border? I'm gonna do it. Let's go back to Canada. Now we're gonna do something else that is pretty cool. And of course, there has to be a pedestrian behind me, you know, making it more difficult for me to perform this maneuver. But uh, <clears throat> I always wanted to, uh, there, there's a, I believe it is, a, yeah, Roosevelt Way. And this is the street, you know, where on the right hand side, we have the United States. And then on the le left hand side, we have the backyards of all these rather lavish uh, residences here on the Canadian side. And a lot of them have the, the Canadian flag to prove it. And I, I don't know why we don't have like any structures here on the, on the other side of the street, you know, with the American flags. That would be cool. But yeah. <laughs> Isn't that something? Let's drive on this street until the end. I wonder if we can go all the way to the other side of the peninsula. 
Imagine the rear fence of your backyard being a border wall. And that's exactly what this is. By the way, we're in a little bit of a hurry to get back because it is Friday, so we have a live stream this afternoon. Oh, it says road closed. I guess we're gonna have to turn around. But still, let's see how far it goes. Yep, this is it. And that is the border crossing right there. All right, let's cross the proper way. They really grilled us with questions this time. And look at the line to going to Point Roberts now. We had to make a last-minute decision because tomorrow we want to visit Victoria. And what we didn't realize is how much driving was involved. It is almost an hour drive to the terminal, and then once you get to Vancouver Island, it is another half an hour drive. So we've made an executive decision, and we're going to fly. But that will be on the next episode. Until then, thank you so much for watching. And see you on the road. Well, good morning. We came to downtown because uh, the ferry was full, so we're gonna take a seaplane. Because that's how we do it. Well, we had not been to this part of Vancouver here in downtown. Very cool. Maybe we'll, we'll have dinner here this afternoon <laughs> after we come back. Check it out, they have a lot of seaplanes here. And here's the terminal. Let's watch this one take off. I think seaplanes are so cool, and we're soon getting on one of those. These are much bigger and hopefully more comfortable than the one we took to Brooks Camp in Katmai National Park a couple of weeks ago. is airborne. Yeah, I love airplanes in general, all kinds of aircraft actually, but seaplanes are particularly cool. Now let's go check in and have some breakfast. We're having the signature breakfast wrap. Mm. One after the other. Ready to go. We're going to follow our pilot. And yeah, they changed our gate last minute. Transport Canada requires all passengers to obey crew instructions as needed. What a great view of North Vancouver from up in the air. And downtown on the other side.
Would that be Point Atkinson Lighthouse? I think so. We hiked to it back in 2019. Such beautiful mountains. I think that's where the Sea to Sky Highway goes. And I wonder, what's that on the water? That would have been our ferry, perhaps. And what's up with a different color on the water? I believe that might be Montague Harbor on Galliano Island. Yes, I was looking on satellite view. It is such a beautiful archipelago, as seen from up above. And that looks like a town called Ganges. We can already see the Strait of Juan de Fuca and the Hurricane Ridge in Olympic National Park. Yeah, those mountains are in the USA. There's the Victoria Harbor, and we're about to land. What a great view of the Victoria Harbor. Well, that was a very smooth landing. Here's the Fisherman's Wharf area with all the houseboats, which we will visit later. This, by the way, is not going to be an in-depth exploration. I had been here back in 2019, but Illy has never been. So we're just gonna explore the inner harbor area, which is very picturesque. This happens to be the capital of British Columbia, so here we have the very opulent Parliament building. Well, here we are, we've made it to Victoria, the capital of British Columbia. Lots of, lots of activity here today in Victoria. There's something called the Empress. No, the Empress is a hotel. There's the, the Dragon Fest and a race and there's people, you know, everywhere. <laughs> and here's that spot where you take the mandatory picture with the Canada sign, the parliament building behind it. It's iconic. What's happening today is the Dragon Boat Festival. And here's the inner harbor. There's always something going on here. Well, at least the two times I've been in this city, it's been very busy. There comes the ferry, either from Seattle or Port Angeles. This is the Victoria Cenotaph, a war memorial to the unknown soldier. Here's the iconic statue of Queen Victoria, who the city is named after, right here in front of the Parliament building. The city does have a little bit of a European feel to it. Parliament building naturally under construction, as it is usually the case when we visit places like this. But, uh, by the way, we couldn't have asked 
for better weather today. This one is called the Knowledge Totem, erected in 1990, carved by master carver Cicero August, a member of the Coast Salish indigenous people of the Pacific Northwest, and his two sons. We're going to continue walking around the inner harbor. This sequoia planted here on the parliament grounds is also the provincial Christmas tree. Next to the parliament, we encounter the Royal BC Museum. And what we hear is the Netherlands Centennial Carillon, a gift from the Dutch community to celebrate Canada's 100th birthday in 1967. The carillonist or carilloneur, when present, actually has to go up those stairs in order to play with his fists and feet. Although it can also play automated, as it is probably now. Here we have a sundial, the soundtrack provided by the carillon. Here's a garden with plants native to the west coast of North America. Here's Thunderbird Park, featuring 11 traditional totem poles and the Mongo Martin House. It is a traditional First Nations Northwest Coast house. Yeah, totems are totally a thing here in Victoria. Next, we have the lavish Empress Hotel and the statue depicting Emily Carr, a renowned Canadian artist and writer, Victoria native, famous for her paintings inspired by the First Nations and the landscapes of British Columbia. Oh, it's a monkey. As I said, here's the very opulent Empress Hotel, opened in 1908, built in the Chateau-esque style. It is considered one of Canada's grand railway hotels. landscaping everywhere and we wanted to go inside the building maybe get something to drink but it is too early for that here they have some honeybees that apparently pollinate the flowers and herbs in the garden and produce 700 pounds of honey every year and that's it I'm not going any farther the Art Deco Tower is the visitor center and here they have this topiary orca it is called the surfacing. They even made some plants look like a blowhole of sorts. Here's Rogers Chocolates, established in 1885, as we walk along Government Street. Right, this one is called Government Street, where we are. We're just uh, pretty much aimlessly walking around, and uh, this one seems to be pedestrian from noon to 10 p.m., so... Maybe at lunchtime we'll come back and, and see something. There's uh, our map of Vancouver Island. Here's the old Victoria Customs House. This is Bastion Square. Bastion Square is this pedestrian street, two blocks long, with many historic 19th century buildings. And there seems to be a street market today. Here's the Board of Trade building, erected in 1892. And it's still early, not too many people, vendors are still setting up. It is a lovely street, and if memory serves from my 2019 trip, there's an Irish pub here on the corner, which I want to visit later. There, Irish Times it is called. Let's continue walking around and see what else we discover, what else we stumble upon. It is definitely too early for some of these places. Johnson Street here seems pretty lively. Oh, Market Square. Let's check it out. 
But as you may have noticed, we're just walking around aimlessly. This must get really busy by lunchtime. Something tells me we're approaching Chinatown. This happens to be the oldest Chinatown in Canada, which makes sense given our geographical location. The only older Chinatown in North America would be San Francisco. This one began in the mid-19th century, after a great migration of miners from California during the Fraser Canyon Gold Rush of 1858. So many restaurants. Too bad we're not really hungry yet. And we're not in the mood for Chinese anyway. In fact, I don't know what we are in the mood for. Dragon Alley here is one of several narrow alleyways here in Chinatown, originally dating back to 1890. Well, at least the buildings it went through. Oh, if these walls could talk, huh? Now this part is surprisingly more modern, with a bunch of small businesses here. Let's keep on walking on this narrow passageway. Where are we now? It seems odd that everything is kind of dead and empty. I mean, yeah, it's, it's 11 a.m., I guess. I guess people don't go out for beer until like afternoon, right? <laughs> um, we have a, an airstream with refreshments. We're back by the harbor and check out all the water taxis. We gotta get on one of those. It's 5 o'clock somewhere, right? It's a Fat Tug IPA, the same beer we had in Dawson City. And here's the brew pub. Let's see how this works, the water taxi that is. There are no water taxis right now, so I guess we're gonna have to do that later. Yeah, I guess we have to go around. We were gonna go to the Butchart uh, Gardens, but this is the thing. We, have, we would have to be back here. I mean, our flight back to Vancouver is at 4 p.m. It's already almost noon. So, um, yeah, we're going to have to save that one for another time, as, uh, as is usually the case. We're just going to enjoy uh, the downtown harbor area here and, and just get a, a vibe for the city. Get some to eat and explore. But the, the way this is uh, Tug Eatery, and uh, I think by, by now, Fat Tug is my, my favorite. Canadian beer, I think. Or at least my, my favorite British Columbia beer, beer for sure. And it is from here, from Victoria. Yeah, I think we're gonna walk across the Johnson Street Bridge here now. And by the way, these condos, very nice, I wouldn't mind. But there's one problem. Living on top of a brewery could be disastrous for me, so maybe not. <laughs> Now all the water taxis are here, it figures. We are too impatient sometimes. That mountain over there, I believe that is Hurricane Ridge in Washington. I believe these water taxis are called pickle boats. Do you see the resemblance? We are now on the other side, and check out this view of the inner harbor. Oh yeah, this is a fabulous view. Oh, 
Well, this is very nice. We just discovered this walking path here. There's like, you know, lounge chairs back there. So you can, you know, on a day like today, you know, taking the, the sun rays, you know. I don't know, do they have a beach here? Anyway, we're gonna we're gonna walk around a little more actually. Let's go, let's go down to the water level. And the views. We have we get commanding views of the parliament building on that side and it's very nice. Victoria is a very picturesque uh, city for sure. We're going to walk around the harbor a little bit, which by the way, this is another water taxi stop. And here we have some Canada geese in Canada. How appropriate. And the dragon boat races keep going and going. This rock here is called Songhis Point. Songhis is, by the way, another name for the Salish people of this land. It's a big totem pole. Here's some close-up detail of that totem pole. And here's the view from the top of the rock. On the other side, we can see Fisherman's Wharf with all those very super picturesque houseboats. And it looks like there is a water taxi stop over there too. Yeah, I think that should be our next point of interest. Here we have some other folks, leisurely paddling up the harbor. We can see so much from this higher vantage point. Basically, most of the places we've already been to. Start heading back and try to get on a water taxi at the Inner Harbor stop. Okay, much livelier now. Yeah. Yeah. The market, we got live music. Let me tell you, with all this walking, we have worked up an appetite. So let's go to that Irish pub I mentioned earlier for an IPA and some bar grab. Because that is what we are in the mood for. It is a very cool bar. It's got character. We actually ordered a mushroom dip and pierogies. So yeah, this place has a lot of character. And we just had some appetizers and uh, it was good. This is the, the same Irish pub I came to uh, in 2019, although I don't think I did any video in here back in 2019. Thank you. Yeah, it's the real thing. Hmm, Havana cigars. The real thing. Let's check it out. Hmm, it looks pretty cool. The Canadian red chairs. That's a 1970-something... Is that an Impala? Yep, very similar to the car I learned to drive on, but mine wasn't compatible, or nearly as, as, as well kept as that one. The Dragon Race seems to be an all-day event. And now we're going to try to get on a water taxi. The harbor is so full of activity. 
Let me tell you something as far as cities go, I really like this one. At least to visit. There's so much to do. We'll definitely be back here sooner than later. Perhaps as part of that trip to Tuk to Yuk Tuk, potentially in 2025. Hundredth anniversary of the Canadian Navy. The statue is called the Homecoming. And here's the, the Art Deco uh, Visitor Center. We're gonna get on a water taxi because we're gonna, we're gonna do the tour, but we don't have time at this point. Yep, we're getting on one of those seaplanes soon. That's one very nice mega yacht. Wharf seems to be happening, so let's get off the boat. All right, that was a fun ride. This is such a picture perfect location. All these houseboats, by the way, are privately owned, meaning people actually live here. So we must respect their privacy as much as possible. Oh no, they left without us. No, come back, come back. I'm sure there's someone, someone in there looking at us. Like... I mean, it is idyllic, but I don't know if I would like to live at such a popular tourist destination. Private residence. It, it, I mean, it, it, it probably sucks living here with all, all of us tourists, you know, eaves dropping into your cute homes, right? Um, but then again, it would be really cool to, to live on a floating house here. We've seen this before in other cities like Seattle. I think Vancouver has a district also. Here comes the big ferry from Port Angeles. How do I know? Because that's the same one I took in 2019, the Coho, I just remembered. Maybe next time we can stay at a floating bed and breakfast. What do you think? Well, this one is an actual boat. I just love it.
This is the quiet part of the wharf, the marina back here. I don't think there's a lot to see or do, so let's go back. I think we're going to walk back to the seaplane terminal. We have time, and as I've said before, no, I think I have. I think walking is the only way to really get to know a city. It is only two kilometers, which is one and a quarter mile or so. And after all we've walked today, that's nothing. But first I want to check out the last row of houseboats. I am fascinated. In a different life, I would have loved to live in one of these. But one that moves, you know, like a floating RV. I mean, I guess technically this could be moved as well, like a tiny house. You know, I'm thinking like that pontoon boat we saw at the gates of the mountains in Montana. They don't seem very hydrodynamic though. The wharf, definitely worth a visit. Next time we'll come hungry. And thirsty for that matter. Uh, that is not the right time. Yeah, this is definitely uh, a must see here in, in, in Victoria. Now we're gonna walk back, we have an hour left of fun here in the capital of British Columbia. This building here, wonderful views. I mean, it looks kind of old, but still, you know, it's got that character and look at that, look at the views of the Fisherman's Wharf here. <laughs> well, we're gonna keep on going. Well, we're taking the the coastal trail here. Yeah. About you? Everywhere you look, everywhere you look in this city. I mean, look to this side. Look, look everywhere you want. It's it's worth taking a picture. It's amazing. Yep, definitely an all-day event. In the coastal trail here. We are by the ferry terminals. That's our plane there. One of those is our seaplane. And did I mention? By the way, nice yacht there. Someone told me it belongs to a Brazilian millionaire, but did I mention how much I like these little taxis here? without us. Oh no, we came on a plane, never mind. Our time here is coming to an end. So it is with a heavy heart that we say goodbye to Queen Victoria and to the beautiful city that bears her name. We barely scratched the surface here, but that was the whole plan, to be honest about it.
the festival is still going and there's such great ambience. So great to experience a random event at whatever city you are visiting. I feel we should at least spend one night here. Next time, we'll definitely take the ferry, come with the RV, but now we do have a seaplane to catch. All right, let's check in and get back to Vancouver. We are on the 1605 flight. All passengers to obey crew instructions as needed. Safety briefing cards are in the seat backs in front of you. Next time, Victoria. Could that be Vancouver in the distance? We are getting close to the big metropolis.
I believe that's English Bay Beach over there. And we can kind of see the entrance to False Creek. I was gonna edit and cut some of this out, but it is so rare to get such amazing footage with such perfect weather of such a beautiful city that I'm just gonna let the camera roll. That's it for our scenic seaplane ride. And we're back in Vancouver. Just like that. I think this is it for our Vancouver adventure. Tomorrow we're crossing back to the USA. Today we're going south, back to the USA, then across the USA, destination Florida. Oh no, that looks like it's going to be a while, especially in this super tight RV park. Let's look for another way out. It is a beautiful day in British Columbia. We're getting off the highway at the very last exit before the border crossing in order to visit our last point of interest in Canada. Yeah, there's one more.
Well, good morning. We just ate the last of our eggs because just in case we're about to cross the border. But before we do that, there's a monument here erected right at the border. It's called the Peace Arch. And I've always wanted to see it. But it feels kind of strange to be here uh, walking in this uh, no man's land. That's uh, the entrance to Canada. And over there is the entrance to the United States. And this is like a no man's land here in the in the middle between the two countries, but the actual border is exactly underneath the bridge. So, I mean, the, the arch, so. There it is, the Peace Arch. It is a British Columbia Provincial Park on this side and the Washington State Park on the other. But it is also considered an international park, so you don't need a passport to visit, as long as you exit the park into the same country you entered it. It's the 49th parallel. We're back in the USA. <laughs> Actually, I could stand in two countries at the same time. There's a totem pole and the topiary of the Canadian flag on one side and one of the American flag on the other. Saying goodbye. See you soon to the great land of Canada. Now let's go back across the border properly, reflecting on our time here, as this, at least symbolically, marks the end of our adventure, which began in Miami, Florida, just 10 days short of three months ago. It feels longer and shorter at the same time, and precisely 10 days is the time it's going to take us to get back home. Well, this was really cool. I always wanted to do that. I've seen pictures and people even have done meetups here. And uh, the last time we were here that we crossed through this port of entry, I totally forgot about it. So now we did it. Now we have about a 10 day drive to Florida. Yeah, we're gonna hightail it. Crossing of the border was uh, uneventful for the most part. Uh, I turned off the, the, go, the rooftop GoPro just in case. I don't think they really care. But uh, yeah, just the, the standard questions. And uh, now, well, it's great to be back in the USA. Yeah, maybe. Uh, well, hopefully, the Seattle crossing will be uneventful as well. We're approaching the Cascades. Would that be Mount Baker, perhaps? I really hope we get to see Mount Rainier later, after we pass Seattle. Suddenly, there's a haze in the air, probably smoke from wildfires. There it is, the unmistakable Seattle skyline. Seattle is such a beautiful city, and yes, it has problems besides the horrible traffic, but it is a great city nonetheless. We must revisit sometime. In fact, hadn't we been kind of homesick and returning from such a long trip to Alaska, we probably would have stopped for a few days.
This is the route we're going to follow for the next 10 days. All the way home. After Seattle, we take I-90 East, and we're going to be on this interstate for almost 1,500 miles, with only one brief detour to visit Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, for two reasons. We've never been there, and we've heard it's lovely. And I've been feeling a vibration in Starship's steering at high speed. I'm assuming it has something to do with the tire rotation we did in Vancouver, but I need to have someone take a look at it. Today we're driving across the Cascade Mountains, and eventually the Rockies, and in a few days the Appalachians. One thing I love about cross-country road trips is all the changes in topography, in vegetation, in climate. And although I do have a soft spot for the West, every area has its charms and allures. In other words, we're in for a great ride across the North American continent. And it is plain to see, after crossing the last of the Cascades, we're already in a totally different climate zone. Ooh, busy little place. This, by the way, is the Columbia River, and it is staggering how quickly the rainforest turned into desert. I wonder what other climate zones loom ahead. It is now 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Coming from Alaska, this is unfathomable. And that reflection is definitely a GM design flaw. It happens whenever the sun is directly behind you. Eventually, we make it to Spokane, and shortly after, Idaho. There's the crease on the pavement. Boom. Welcome to Idaho. Thank you. This is our site here. And now there's a brewery walking distance that way. Trail Sand Craft Beer. Trail Sand. Perfect way to end a long driving day. Tomorrow we'll take care of some errands and explore a little bit. <sighs> and we're back by the RV park. And here we are by the entrance. Perfect location. Well, we've been here in Cordoline all day. It's, uh, it's incredibly hot. I mean, we haven't felt this hot. It feels like Las Vegas hot. It's that dry heat, you know, even though it's not quite 100, but it's high 90s. I didn't feel the need to film it, but this morning I took Starship to a local tire shop after the Chevy dealer told me they couldn't look at it. And it turns out it was mud stuck to the rims. Probably from the Dalton Highway. And the reason I may not have noticed it before was because it was on the rear tires. But after the rotation, that's when I did notice it in the steering. They didn't even want to charge me any money. So thank you, Perfection Tire and Auto Repair. If you're in Coeur d'Alene, I recommend them.
Well, here we are at the beach here on the lake. I'm not gonna do much because, to be honest, uh, I forgot my bathing suit. But it's a perfect day for the beach, actually. This one is called Boardwalk Public Beach. And there is a boardwalk of sorts that we're going to walk on later. There are all kinds of activities here. Parasailing, paddle boarding, float plane rides. Too bad it is too late in the day and we didn't really come prepared for this. There is also Sanders Beach, which by the way, it is mostly private. Only this small section is available to the public. And there's access east of here as well. All these nice houses and properties, they own their own little private section of the beach. We're going back to the Boardwalk Beach area. Well, we decided to park here for an hour and walk around a little bit by the lake. It's very nice and uh, in the shade it's not as bad, but in the sun it's scorchingly hot. This is a very nice park here, actually. This is what we're gonna do next. We are going to walk along this lakefront trail. It is actually called the North Idaho Centennial Trail. Cool, time capsule. I don't think we're gonna be around to see that one open. Quite a few people here, cooling down in the lake, considering it is a Monday. We are now in the private section of the beach. I guess this is their private beach. Yeah, the public beach ends there. But this side of the beach seems uh, to be private property, you know, belonging to all these pretty nice houses <laughs> on this side of the street. Yeah, it says private property all over down there, so I guess you could enjoy from a watercraft, but not the sand itself. Yeah, private property, please use city beach. Very nice, very nice. Anyway, let's turn around. Let's go back to the public beach. Alright, this was very nice, but we didn't come prepared, so I'll bring my bathing suit next time. Let's go back to the car. The Starship Enterprise. And we're back. Yeah, we decided to end the day at the same place we did yesterday. Twigs with pesto. And tacos. Good beer, good food, really good pizza actually. And walking distance to the RV park. Well, good morning. 
uh, today going to Montana. I don't know exactly where we're gonna stop, Livingston probably. I doubt we're gonna make it all the way to, to Billings. So, uh, but first, let's try to do a little bit of a car wash because Minitini still has dirt from the Dalton Highway in Alaska, <laughs> if that's even possible. It is still kind of dirty, but at least it is better than it was. Coeur d'Alene, barely knew you, but we'll be back, I promise. Ooh, check out the lake. I-90 here we get great views of Lake Coeur d'Alene. We really owe it to ourselves to return. As I mentioned, it was never our intention to explore this area in any depth. Florida is really the destination in our crosshairs. And whatever we get to see along the way is gonna be a bonus. And this was definitely more than we expected. I mean, take a look at this lake. A huge lake, by the way. And we couldn't have asked for better weather. It is going to be a long journey and we are about to cross the bitter roots. And as you know, mountains are my happy place. We are certainly going to miss these landscapes once we get to the Great Plains. climbing the Bitterroot Mountains. And if you recall, we crossed the Bitterroots last year in 2022, a little farther south on US-12 as part of our Lewis and Clark trip. As we reach Lookout Pass, we are now in Montana and there's a sign overhead, but if you blinked, you missed it. Now we have nowhere to go but down, although we still have quite a few mountains to go through. Sometimes I find these curvy roads a little tedious, but I'm sure I'm going to miss them once we hit South Dakota. So let's enjoy the pretty mountainous landscape while it lasts. Take a look at this barren mountain here. I mean, it is gorgeous everywhere. Now going along the Clark Fork River, and particularly today, I mean, it is more about the journey than the destination. This is the essence, the whole reason for a cross-country road trip, to witness the landscape rolling by, ever-changing. Also, if you're into trains and you want to see firsthand how commerce happens, how cargo moves around this great land, you gotta come to the West. Just like that, we are out of the bitter roots as we approach Missoula, as proven by the M on the side of the mountain. Let's get a closer look. We're about to go through some of the areas we visited during our Lewis and Clark trip of 2022. Although, during the second part of that trip, it was really smoky from wildfires. 
it is going to be a treat to see it in this great weather. No matter which way I put it, there is no way to oversell this drive. Journalist Charles Kuralt, who was famous for his 1970s on the road segments on CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite, and this, by the way, was way before my time. Anyway, he traveled with an RV and famously said, thanks to the interstate highway system, it is now possible to travel across the country from coast to coast without seeing anything. Well, he probably didn't drive on Interstate 90 in western Montana. We may not be getting into the heart of small-town America, but the scenery has certainly been fabulous. Now approaching Butte, Montana. Although we're not going into town, we've been here before, twice actually. And it is a very peculiar town, very picturesque. But no, we must continue. All this is starting to look so familiar, like we've definitely been here before. And we have. We are now on the Lewis and Clark Trail. Here's a junction to the Lewis and Clark Caverns and Yellowstone National Park. Now crossing the Jefferson River and the Madison River, both headwater tributaries to the Missouri. We must be getting really close to Three Forks. Here in Bozeman, well, I made a wrong turn and the navigation has taken us on all these residential streets and all I wanted to do was put gas. Now, what is this? This is like the narrowest street with the tiniest roundabouts. Definitely not big rig friendly. I mean, we barely fit. Well, at least it gave us a chance to see a little bit of Bozeman. We've never actually stopped here. Not that I recall. We're about to drive through Livingston, and this is the point where we intersect our northern route of nine weeks ago, when we were coming from Yellowstone on the way to Alaska. Now crossing the Yellowstone River, and we were thinking of continuing an extra two hours to Billings, perhaps boondock with our friends Mike and Barbie, but we're gonna have to save that one for another time. It's been a long day, so we're gonna start looking for somewhere to spend the night, with full hookups preferably, it is kind of hot in Montana. Here's a KOA right next to the interstate, so we can make it an early start tomorrow. And that's what we're going to do. So good morning, beautiful day here in Montana. And today, well, today we continue driving pretty much non-stop back east. Uh, we're not gonna see much, but there's always stuff to do to see from the road, right? Uh, we're gonna cross into Wyoming and eventually South Dakota. I'm gonna spend the night in South Dakota, just don't know exactly where. <laughs> we're gonna drive, you know, as far east as possible today. We didn't get as early a start as we were hoping for, but we'll make good time today. But that KOA, probably a little 
pricey for what it is, but it's convenience. Man. We're like, what, a quarter mile from, from I-90. And uh, yeah, we just needed one night with, with you know, electric. I mean, in theory, we could have moon docked and turned on the, the generator, but I had points, so I only paid $10 for it <laughs> with my KOA points, so that works. Now we have almost a full tank of gas, so almost two hours non-stop here on 990. Here's the Laurel Oil Refinery as we approach Billings. Billings, of course, the largest city in Montana, at a whopping 117,000 inhabitants. Believe it or not, that is more than 10% the entire state's population. Yes, folks, Montana is empty, for it being the fourth largest state in the Union. Yep, it is pretty much empty, at just 1.1 million inhabitants. Only Wyoming and Alaska are less populated. It would have been cool to stop and explore a little bit, but we must continue pushing east and a little bit south. Ooh, the landscape is changing once again. Look at this land, this prairie. This feels like the most isolated part of Montana. Check out that horse riding on the bed of the truck. I've never seen that before. And we are now in Wyoming. The topography is starting to change once again as we start approaching the Black Hills of Eastern Wyoming and Western South Dakota. Yes, we are almost in the Mount Rushmore state. There's the sign, we are now in South Dakota. We're gonna be driving through Rapid City, Gateway to Mount Rushmore, Crazy Horse, Custer State Park, and so many other attractions in the area. But we were here last year, so we're not going to linger. We continue east. Little by little, it is starting to look more and more like the Great Plains. But the real change won't happen until we cross the Missouri River. You'll see. So many hay bales, and now I know how they are made. That will be a future video. We're entering an area of beautiful grassland prairie. With all these rolling hills, it is captivating. Especially in this late afternoon light, and a little bit of smoke in the air certainly enhances the experience. We are also approaching Waldrug and the Badlands. Enter the Badlands. In a version of the plan, we were going to boondock at the wall, just outside Badlands National Park but ultimately decided against it. Instead, we're going to drive an extra hour 
and stay really close to I-90. We're going to stay at the Belvedere East KOA journey as the day comes to an end and we get to witness this smoke-infused sunset. Smoke sucks when you want to see distant mountains, but it gives the sun a unique quality, especially at this time of the day. And this is it. Check out that sunset. That's incredible. Well, good morning. What can I say? It's lovely out here in South Dakota. I like the, you know, all the prairies here. And um, once again, today is going to be hotter than normal. We're going to try to find a campground somewhere near Council Bluffs, Iowa. That's kind of the plan. It's still like a half, five and a half, six hour drive. But it's not going to be as, as much as a marathon of a drive as yesterday. Yeah, we're, I think we're more than halfway across the country. Well, 10 minutes into our route, we have now entered the central time zone. We lost an hour. Welcome to Flyover Country, also known as the Great Plains. The Great Plains? Well, not all of it is as flat as we've been led to believe. Some of it is, though. It is usually not as flat once we get close to a major river like the one we're about to cross. Crossing the Missouri River on the Lewis and Clark Memorial Bridge onto Chamberlain. This will be our first stop of the day, and for such an out-of-the-way area, this is the third time we visit this particular point of interest. Actually, if you're making the road trip west on I-90, I mean to or from Mount Rushmore, stopping here is a no-brainer. You get a Lewis and Clark Visitor Center and the great statue. Well, here we are, we've crossed the mighty Missouri River and uh, as Steinbeck so eloquently put it in his book, uh, Travels with Charlie, um, Everything west of here kind of still feels and looks and smells like the American West, kind of arid. And uh, as we continue here, uh, going back east, uh, it starts feeling more like the Great Plains, right? We're going to see more cornfields and... and uh, how did he put it? He said, this is where, where the, the map should fold. You know, it's like the Missouri River is like that crease on the map. The main thing to see here at this particular spot and that is the Dignity statue and uh, here we are, you know, kind of in the middle of the great state of South Dakota. We still have about less than two hours to go to Iowa but I thought it would be, a, you know, a good spot to stop. Uh, the first time we came here it's, it was not all under construction and uh, today it is not so Let's check it out. Officially called Dignity of Earth and Sky, the work of Del Clos Lampier, it depicts a native woman standing high on a bluff above the Missouri River. The woman wears a plain style dress and is receiving a star quilt. According to Lampier, the sculpture honors the culture of the Lakota and Dakota peoples native of these lands. I originally thought it was supposed to be Sacagawea, but I was wrong. And there's the mighty Missouri River. Of 
we were exactly here twice actually last year during our Lewis and Clark uh, reenactment uh, trip and uh, make sure you check out that series uh, where we you know pretty much followed the, the Lewis and Clark expedition all the way from Pittsburgh all the way to the, to the Pacific Ocean to seaside Oregon all right let's continue as I said to um, about two hours I'm gonna stop at a Walmart to resupply and then probably Council Bluffs, which is another Lewis and Clark location. I don't know how evident it looks to you, but to me, the change is drastic. We are unequivocally no longer in the West. Yes, this seems to be one of the really flat parts of the Great Plains. Oh no, what could have possibly happened there? Anyway, we are by now past the halfway point in the continent, but we're still really far north. So, after a quick stop at Walmart in Sioux Falls to get some last-minute essentials, we're going to turn to the south on Interstate 29. Another super flat part, even though we're pretty close to the Missouri River. Eternity later, we are about to cross the Big Sioux River into Iowa and Sioux City. The tall obelisk in the distance is a monument dedicated to Sergeant Floyd the only member of the Lewis and Clark expedition to die, of appendicitis of all things. We can already see the Omaha skyline in the distance. We're staying at Council Bluffs on the other side of the Missouri River at the Horseshoe Casino. Well, good morning. Pretty windy this morning. It was a pretty good stay here at the Horseshoe Casino for like 40 bucks a night. Can't beat it. And if we were going to into Omaha, Omaha is just right across the river, so it's not bad. Water and electric. Um, and now today we have less than four hours, which is unusual for this trip of ours in which we've been, as they say, hightailing it back uh, east or southeast. Today, uh, we're gonna stay at a Love's truck stop just east of Kansas City from where we're going to do the live stream. So let's, let's get underway. Let's hit the road. Today, we continue southbound on I-29 onto Kansas City. It is going to be a rather uneventful drive and not particularly scenic except for lowest hills here on the left. Oh, and we did manage to kill a bug with the lens. Let's skip to the part where we cross into the show me state. The other exciting part, of course, is driving through Kansas City, one of my favorite cities in the Midwest. Although to the uninitiated, it can be a little tricky to navigate. Or maybe it is me. For some reason, I always end up driving on the wrong lane for the exit that I want to take. Which, in our case, is going to be I-70 East. Here we are on I-70 East towards St. Louis. We're going to stop at a Love's RV stop at a town called Bates City just east of Kansas City. But first, 
We can't pass by Kansas City without having some barbecue. And there's a famous joint right across the interstate from Love's. It is called Bates City Barbecue. This is it. I got a to-go order, so we'll eat it when we get to Love's. It was walking distance, actually, but not at all pedestrian friendly. And we don't want to unhitch tonight, so that's why we went to the barbecue joint first. Some of the newer Love's RV stops are very nice, like RV parks, but this is not one of them. This one is just like a parking area with water and electric. Incredible! A car just parked where I'm supposed to back into. I mean, I'm gonna back in anyway. I'll work around it. And he parked at a proper parking space. That barbecue actually tasted better than it looked. And we ate a lot. A little too much sauce. Maybe I should have said something. And we're here at the Love's uh, RV hookups. And I guess not all Love's RV hookups are created equal. This one almost seems like an afterthought. I mean, compared to the one we stayed in Oklahoma City almost three months ago. Um, this is just like five spots here. And I was under, 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 under the impression that they were all full hookups, but no, this is only water and electric. And there's a dump station over there. Let me show it to you. And let me show you the RV hookups check-in, I guess. I mean, I, I imagine nowadays very few people use the, the kiosk here. Everybody uses the app, which is good. With the app, you also get uh, 10 cents off gas. But yeah, the RV hookups kiosk uh, here, it's... Uh, no more <laughs> and here's the dump station it's supposedly it's ten dollars for the dump station I guess they unlock it for you and it's kind of in the in a weird spot here just because of the fact that if you by the way the lock is unlocked if there's someone you know uh, putting air in their tires you really can't uh, dump here anyways uh, we have a live stream coming up, so that's what we're going to do next. Well, good morning. Well, today is going to be the longest uh, driving day of the whole trip. We're going to try to do 548 miles to Nashville. I think we can do it. It's early. Let's stop off the, the gas and get underway. Yeah, my, my brilliant plan of planning the return trip only using uh, Love's uh, RV stops didn't work out so well. <laughs> um, we only stopped at one, and one that didn't have a sewer. So a shower, a shower didn't happen this morning. <laughs> Let's get on the way. 600 feet, turn left toward outer road. It is going to be one of those all-day drives. And there are lots of beautiful things to see in Missouri, and for that matter also Southern Illinois, Western Kentucky, Tennessee, but few of them you can see from the interstate. So here I'm just going to show you the highlights. crossing the Missouri River one last time. We are very close to its confluence with the Mississippi. There it is, the Gateway Arch. We are about to cross the Mississippi.
I think I may have made a wrong turn here, but it doesn't really matter. In the end, old roads lead to Illinois. At least a quarter of the roads. I just noticed there's another horseshoe casino here. I doubt this one has RV parking. Now we're going to cross the Great River into the land of Lincoln. Passing Metropolis, we cross the Ohio River, saying goodbye to Illinois and saying hello to Kentucky. Ooh, that's a nice 1984-ish Cadillac. Anyway, let's put gas. Well, at 334, well, 339 minus the good Sam discount. This is by far the cheapest gas in the past uh, two and a half months. Head west. West? Where, which way is west? Let's take a break at the Kentucky Welcome Center. I think this is the part of the interstate highway system Charles Gurault was referring to. Just trees and roads. We are now crossing the Tennessee River, dammed upstream forming Kentucky Lake, and the Cumberland River, which is also dammed, forming Lake Barkley. The land between those two is called the land between the lakes. We visited this area back in 2017 to witness the great solar eclipse and we owe it to ourselves to return sometime. Which, coincidentally, there's another total solar eclipse happening around here in 2024. You can't really appreciate it from the inner state, but this is a beautiful area of Kentucky. And Tennessee, as the sign indicates. When I cross the Mississippi, I'm more than halfway home. I'm getting tired, I'm getting sleepy. I've been away for too long. Well, when you are from Florida, very few things evoke your home state as much as Publix. And lo and behold, there is one here. This may be one of the farthest tours from the mothership. We had to do it. More trees and blacktop, until eventually we see the unmistakable Nashville skyline, with the Batman building and all the rest. A part of me wants to unhitch and come to downtown, Broadway, all the honky-tonks, but it is probably not gonna happen. We are going to be staying at the Nashville East KOA Journey. A little bit of a detour, but we can really use full hookups tonight. Well, this KOA, well, this is my second time here. This KOA was very nice, actually. This site was very nice. But, um, yeah, we didn't really get to enjoy it. And uh, even worse, we didn't even get to enjoy Nashville, which is one of my favorite cities, but this was just a stepping stone. Today we're going into Georgia and then Pelicamp.
Here we retake I-24 East towards Chattanooga. We're going to start seeing mountains soon. Not like we saw a few days ago out west. The Appalachians are a much older mountain range. That's the Cumberland Plateau, the highest pass we're gonna have to climb, just under 2,000 feet above sea level. Which was a challenge when I had a less capable tow vehicle, but not anymore. We've made it to the top, Mount Eagle, Tennessee. Down we go. This side seems to be a little steeper, and the real challenge for truck drivers, particularly those with heavy loads. Now crossing the Tennessee River, very close to the spot where Tennessee, Georgia, and Alabama meet. This is that spot where the interstate dips briefly into Georgia, only to re-emerge in Tennessee one more time before Chattanooga. I-24 through Chattanooga is one of those bottlenecks that form in the interstate highway system where all the traffic has to go through, lots of semi-truck traffic, although today is not too bad. It is Sunday. It is official, we are now in Georgia. I think this has to be one of the states with the most billboards. I mean, it is true for the whole South, but Georgia takes the cake. We're approaching a town called Calhoun. And you know what they have here? Buckies! A lot of people at this destination Buckies, they leave their cars parked at the pump while they shop. A behavior apparently encouraged by the company. Let me tell you, to me, Bucky's is starting to lose its appeal. They have become way too popular. Perhaps it is time to discover something new. This place is a madhouse. Inside, outside, everywhere. I don't think we're coming back to this particular Bucky's. The one in Calhoun. We'll see the one in Macon tomorrow, maybe. Maybe not. If it is like this, I'm sure there's a Loves or a Flying J next <laughs> close by. It's like they're giving away free beaver nuggets or something, I don't know. We're going to spend the night much docking with family in Ackworth. But what happens in Ackworth stays in Ackworth. See you tomorrow. So we woke up at the crack of dawn to see if we can make it to Pelicamp early. After three months, it is going to be so overgrown. It looks like we're getting some Monday morning rush hour traffic. Crossing Atlanta is not gonna be fun. I-75, I've seen it worse, but it might get worse. Actually, this is not bad at all for Atlanta. Actually, it did get worse. There's always a bottleneck around here. Tell you what, I'm just gonna let the camera roll at four times the speed so you can get the full experience. I wouldn't wanna take that away from you.
it is not a particularly scenic drive, so let's just skip to the good part. Let's stop at the visitor center. It doesn't even feel real to be back in Florida after such a long journey. So first we're going to Pelicamp, our North Florida retreat, and then down to Miami to conclude the voyage home. This is perhaps the most rural area in the Sunshine State, colloquially called the Armpit, officially the Big Bend, nicknamed Forest Capital of Florida, where the peninsula joins the Panhandle. Here we are arriving in Perry, the closest town of any size. Hmm, my neighbor's property is for sale. Oh, it is so overgrown. First, let me turn on the well. I'm gonna have to cut some of the brush where Minitini is supposed to go. And we're back at Pelly Camp. Everything is so overgrown here. Look at that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pretty much cut, you know, all that. And uh, well, the first thing I did, I, you know, I, I cut the grass right here where the grass or the brush, whatever it was, right where, where Minitini was. It's, it's scorched earth here, very, very hot, very humid. And uh, what I'm gonna do, you know, I'm gonna also tr try to get rid of some of the, the pollen branches and whatnot. And uh, maybe I'll fly the drone before we go. But right now, I'm gonna tackle this. neighbor across the street has built quite the compound. Just nine days after this was filmed, Hurricane Italia made landfall right here and ravaged this whole area. So these are the last images from before the storm. The area may never look the same. At the very least, it is going to be a very long time before the forest grows back to the way it was. It is time, 425 miles to go, but we'll be back soon. I'm riding, riding in my RV, wherever I want to be, because I'm free. In my RV, yeah, I'm riding, riding, riding. I'm riding in my RV, my RV, wherever I want to be. Cause I'm free in my RV, yeah. I have no idea how many times I've driven on this road, but trust me, it's been plenty.
now crossing historic Suwannee River. There's a song there somewhere. I'm free in my RV. And this is it. We've made it to the end of the journey. Three months in the making. I lost count of how many miles, but definitely way over 10,000. I would even venture to estimate 13 to 14,000 miles in total. How much did we spend? I'm not sure I want to find out. All I can tell you is that it was an unforgettable experience. A trip of a lifetime. One that I would love to repeat someday. I hope you enjoyed the adventure, which we're going to finish right where we started. On the Dolphin Expressway in Miami, Florida. Until the next one. Thank you so much for watching. And see you on the road. God.
Riding in my arms. 